Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages of Friday's papers. In the next half hour, then, we'll see what's making the headlines. Tonight, I'm joined by the columnist Carol Malone and the editor of The Courier in Dundee, David Clegg. Super to see both of you. Get your thoughts in there in just a moment. Front pages, then, first of all, we start with the Metro. United in grief, but so far apart is the Metro's lead, which says the two estranged princes will not be walking side by side at Prince Philip's funeral on Saturday. Today. Similarly, The Sun has the headline, Brothers at Arm's Length. And The Mail too, which splashes with Brothers Apart. According to the Daily Telegraph, before he died, the Duke of Edinburgh was deeply involved in the planning of the ceremony. Meanwhile, The Guardian reports that government officials have raised concerns about the expansion of COVID-19 testing due to the number of false positives associated with rapid turnaround tests. The Financial Times, leading with what it says is a looming takeover battle for the drug-making giant GlaxoSmithKline. David's paper, The Courier, has a story casting doubt on the election spending pledges of the SNP leader and First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. And bring up the rear, the star features a story about a man who was fined, do I have to say this, for passing wind on a police officer? Pardon me, indeed, pardon me. I'm not sure about that one. Checking your list, it's not there, I hope not. Uh, Carol Malone and David Clegg are here. Um, well, lots of coverage after a briefing today on the, the finer details of the ceremony. Carol, let's start with you on Saturday, including the news from the Daily Telegraph that 18 years of planning by the Duke has led to these plans, notwithstanding, of course, the streamlining of all of this because of, of COVID. Yeah, I mean, he planned, even without COVID, he had planned this funeral himself over a long period of time. And, and you know, it, it seems like a bizarre thing for anyone to do to plan their own funeral. However, you just know that if anyone could do it dispassionately and unemotionally, it would be Prince Philip. You know, he knows it has to be done. He, he always said he never wanted a, a big fuss. And so he, he wanted it simply. And I love the fact the hearse is this Land Rover thing. It looks like a big truck and it's painted in military green and it's going to be flanked by various military personnel reflecting all the, kind of the, you know, the, the services he supported, you know, the military, the Navy, the Royal Marines. Uh, and, and I love the fact, it's, it's almost like he was cocking a snook at... at a tradition by having this kind of hearse. It's it's absolutely him. And it actually, it, when, I, when I was reading about this today, it, oddly enough, it made me smile because I thought, you know, even in death, he is still directing things exactly as he did in life when he was, you know, although he always walked two steps behind the Queen while the pair of them were on duty, he was always absolutely the boss in his own household and, and in life. And, and this funeral is absolutely indicative of that. And I, I, I like it. It's good. Yes. And you, you wonder if there's a sense of humour that goes through some of it, yes. um, including the naval yes. call action stations, uh, which yes. will be sounded a specific request for it which is given at sea to summon all hands to battle stations performed by the buglers of the Royal Marines. Not often heard, the Telegraph tells us, at funerals, although anyone connected to the Royal Navy can request it. And he firmly was connected to the Royal Navy and had deep connections too uh, with many other military outfits, um, David, which will be in full sight and sound uh, at the funeral on Saturday. Yes, indeed. Uh, his service in the Royal Navy will be uh, quite prominent in the service, and I think that does show his individuality, some of the choices there. Uh, I believe that the, the hymn, uh, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, will uh, be, be uh, played as well. Uh, alas, because of the COVID regulations, the, there can't be congressional singing, but the, it, it will be played uh, and, and that will also be another uh, reference to, to his time in the, in the Royal Navy. So I, I do certainly think that there has been the stamp of his uh, individual character uh, all over the, the service as it's been outlined. Uh, and despite the fact that those plans have had to be changed quite considerably, given the, the, the paring down that's had to be done to uh, accommodate the COVID regulations, it is still very much going to be uh, a service that has his personality right through it, I think.
Yes, absolutely. And there is that uh, Land Rover Defender TD5130, which he'd been modifying since 2003, uh, we're told. Um, and that, uh, that is the, the detail that we'll be looking out for. Um, there's a lot of background noise, though, isn't there? If we look at the other newspapers, uh, the Mail, the Sun and so on, which is about the fact that the, the two princes, um, the grandsons, Harry and William, will not be walking um, next to each other. Um, you know, we will be looking out for this stuff too, won't, won't we, Carol? Um, e even though, you know, you, you know the, yeah. the Telegraph has a line that the, uh, the Queen's final preparations aim to steer the royal family into calmer waters. That's Camilla Tomney writing. Um, you know, the, anyone who thought that this funeral might actually heal the rift between the two brothers. I mean, this was, ne it's never gonna happen. It was never gonna happen. You know, not weeks after uh, Prince Harry has labeled his family racists and, and, and after he, you know, he allowed his wife, Meghan, to attack Wills' wife, Kate, and, and say quite hurtful things about her. So this rift is not gonna be healed. And this is such a shame because I think on this day when we should all be remembering uh, Prince Philip, Everyone is going to be watching these two young men. We're going to be watching their reactions to each other. We're going to be watching their reactions to the day. They've been told they cannot walk together. They've been separated by Peter Phillips, Princess Anne's son, which is both ridiculous and sad in a way. You know, they, that, you know that day of all days, the two of them should actually do stuff together. But clearly, they are so badly estranged that they won't walk together. And it's, I mean, except, except I that Peter Phillips is the oldest grandchild, and it could just be that, you know, that gives him... No? You're, you're, you're shaking your no, head. No, I don't, I don't think so, not for a nanosecond. I believe they've been separated because they are so badly estranged, and everyone is, everyone is going to be watching them, which I think is a shame, because all attention should be on what's happening with the funeral and, and on our Queen, and we should be supporting her. But instead, people are going to be watching for facial expressions, they're going to be interpreting what they think they see, what they don't see, and, and it's going to detract attention, I think, from the funeral itself. David, you were trying to come I, in I there. Can't, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't uh, boast about any great insight into the uh, family dynamics, the personal dynamics between between the royal family. But but what I would say is that this this soap opera between William and Harry is is something that quite a few of the papers are leading on tomorrow. And Carol is certainly right that it's going to uh, attract a lot of attention during the funeral. But but something about the way this funeral has been laid out, the fact that it's 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 quite an intimate affair because only 30 people can 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 attend because of the COVID regulations. Uh, his his family from Germany uh, are attending as well. And uh, we know that Megan, of course, is is not making the trip on, on medical advice because she's pregnant. And you know, there is something I think quite humanizing about it that there is this tension in the family as there is in all families. And you know, the, the, these these types of moments are times when when families can reunite and when and when these kind of situations can resolve themselves. So I don't I don't know if I share Carl's uh, cynicism and pessimism to quite that extent that there couldn't be a resolution here. I I, I think that uh, William and Harry have been very close, uh, as we know, uh, as brothers uh, throughout uh, their lives, and you know, no, nothing can be overcome Seriously? and not be overcome in those situations. Seriously, David, do you really think this is weeks after Harry branded Will's family racist? He had to defend his family in public and say, we are not racist. And, and Meghan attacked his wife. You seriously think that, that a couple of, two or three weeks after that, that there's going to be some kind of reconciliation? I don't believe it for a nanosecond. And frankly, I, I don't blame William for not actually forgiving him at this point if he doesn't choose to. And I don't think he would, because I think if there'd been any hint of a reconciliation, they would have walked together. They, we, they wouldn't be going to these lengths to keep them apart. Mm. Is there not an argument that if they were together that there would be even closer scrutiny on what's going on and perhaps this has been some attempt to, to manage that so that it doesn't cause any problems? I think what, what happens on camera and in that moment of the day will probably not be where that could happen, but certainly they'll have an opportunity to talk uh, afterwards at some other point during the weekend. So you never, you never knew what would happen. I wouldn't be uh, so sceptical that nothing could uh, emerge from that. Yes, one of the papers was certainly suggesting that possibly if, if the, uh, the Cambridges have moved back to Kensington Palace for the start of school, having been up in Norfolk, there, there, there might be chance of another meeting, as you say, in the days following the funeral. Um, but, it, but the decision to try and calm things down 
uh, is also the decision to get people to wear suits, isn't it? Because Harry, the most recent active service member of the family, would not be allowed to wear them, so it, he would feel bad. So, you know, the, the Queen is being practical. To be, to be fair, the Duke of Edinburgh is, is known as a practical man too. And really at the heart of this, now because of COVID, it's almost like you've got a private family funeral, but with the cameras allowed to watch in, you know, a few broadcasters in, in, the, in the chapel grounds, as it were, which takes us to the Metro, um, the tears of Charles for his papa, going there to look at the tributes today, the floral tributes, the flowers, the messages laid out at, uh, uh, at the home now of the Commonwealth. Um, and the family will be feeling this deeply, as you say, a real force, Carol, um, at, at home and, and, and away. I really felt for, for Charles particularly today. I mean, he looked really distraught at one point. And, you know, and he, especially, you know, he saw that someone had left um, a little Land Rover um, with the Duke on, with the words, it was a toy Land Rover with the Duke on top. And he looked really moved by that, you know. It's it's very difficult, isn't it, when, you're, when your dad has died and everyone is watching your every move. But his eyes were very... Teary and, and, and Camilla's were too. It's very hard to read those kind of heartfelt messages and, and not be moved. I mean, he's grieving his dad, but he's also looking at the grief of other people. And it's look at his face there. I mean, he looks he looks tortured. And just very briefly, David, we've talked about all eyes on you know the brothers and their body language. Actually, the image will be. Her Majesty the Queen in black, she's normally in very bright colours, wearing a face mask and sitting on her own. I mean, it's kind of devastating, as it has been for people up and down this country during the pandemic. Yes, indeed. I think there is something quite moving about that because uh, so, so many families have uh, had to bury loved ones in the last year uh, and not in the way they would want to in reduced circumstances with people that they, they love and cherish that couldn't be there. Uh, so I think there will be something quite moving for, for everyone about that image of, of the Queen being in that situation as well. Uh, and, of course, the, the poignancy of, of anyone uh, bur burying their, their husband after such a long marriage. Uh, it's unimaginable, really, for most of us to think what that type of longevity in a relationship must be like. So, uh, so I think it will be quite an emotional day. Yes, I'm sure many people will empathise, certainly, uh, with her and, and that experience. Um, more from you in just a moment. Thank you for now. Still to come, we'll talk about the eyebrows raised by David Cameron's lobbying activities. That's in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview with me now, Carol Malone and David Clegg. Welcome back to both of you. Um, Carol, let's delve inside the Metro. Um, eyebrows raised, eye raised an eyebrow. A few people are raising eyebrows, aren't they, about the, the lobbying row amid, uh, well, multiple inquiries now, it seems. Yeah, well, I mean, this is deeply humiliating for, for Cameron on every level because he's being investigated by uh, an investigation launched by Boris, the man he, he holds responsible for having to resign after the 2016 referendum. And, you know, it's snowballing, this story. In the beginning, it just looked like there was there was one white or Mandarin, you know, on his watch who was working for Green. So now we're, we're, learning, uh, we're learning of others. This, today, we learn of a guy called Sir John Manzoni. And uh, he was also working for, for Green Cell while he was um, chief executive for the civil service. Now, this is, you know, th this is actually quite frightening. This is this is terribly reputationally damaging for, for Cameron. Um, you know, and I, but I think we've got to look beyond just the detail that we're saying in this. You know, we've got to look beyond this and look at ordinary people, how they view this. You know, they're looking at these mandarins who are paid. 150 grand plus a year, most of them more than the prime minister, and 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 they're they're and plus their gold plated pensions and all the other perks they get. And these snout in the truck people, 150 grand plus is not a year is not enough for them. They have to have other jobs. And you can't tell me if they're if they're being paid 100 grand a year by a company like Greensill that they're doing their job as a as a top civil servant properly. It just you know it's it's like this elitist group if you get into in government circles if you get into the club if you get into the old boys club you're set for life and it just looks greedy and grasping and and it just it just reinforces the belief that a lot of people have that politicians are only in the job for what they can get for themselves. And it certainly looks this way. Now, Cameron insists he's broken no rules. Well he may not have broken a rule, but what he's done 
doesn't look right and it looks like an abuse of power. And that's what we're seeing. There is a clear abuse of power inside government. And it's it, it's the rich and the well-connected getting richer. Okay. And it's and it's, a t it's terrible to see. Yeah. I think she moved a camera just to show how tidy your kitchen was there, actually. Looks like a hotel, no, honestly. You know what? <laughs> I've, just been in a, I've just been trying to get Murphy because you ran away, you okay. ran outside. So, I, so it's, all moved, it's all the dog, <laughs> not the husband. <laughs> um, yes. she, hasn't, she hasn't left you very long, I'm afraid, David, <laughs> to talk about your front page. So if you don't mind, in 45 seconds, take it away. OK, so uh, it's the Hollywood election in Scotland next month. Uh, the SNP are going to win that election. We know that. It's it's almost certain that they will remain in government. So their manifesto launch, which which was today, is very significant. It is extremely ambitious. It, it suggests that in the next parliamentary term, Nicola Sturgeon plans to uh, invest billions more in the health service and in education and infrastructure. She's pledged to uh, freeze income tax rates and bans and also hold a second independence referendum before the end of 2023. Now, there could be some roadblocks into that. Uh, the IFS has said the the spending pledges haven't been properly costed and would require a lot of tricky trade-offs. And the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said he wouldn't grant a second referendum. So I think we can be pretty confident that Nicola Sturgeon is going to be re-elected. How much of that manifesto she manages to implement over the next five years is more of an open question. Mm, interesting. It's really fascinating. There was a lot of um, shaking heads from Carol. But, uh, Carol, maybe we'll talk about Absolutely. that at half eleven. <laughs> uh, David and uh, Carol, thank you both very much indeed. We'll see you then. Thank you.